Good morning. Everybody kind of scattered out. Makes it look like it's a lot fuller anyway. Glad to, glad to be here with you all. I'm glad for each one that's came this way. Beautiful morning. I, I think it is. This is a, uh, hey, comes in like a lamb. It goes out like a lion. And so I like this weather. It gets us right up to springtime. That's my time of year. Welcome each one of you to the Lord's house. As Mike's already mentioned, Doug, you and Cindy, all of you from Cedarville and different churches, we're glad you're here. And uh, yeah, know that a lot of people went to their home churches this morning, and there'll be some coming in about noon, so we understand that, and we accept that. Uh, a lot of, I, I want to say before we even look at these verses, I, uh, I want to thank the church here for entertaining this meeting and, and taking care of it and for making us feel welcome, providing for us. And I want to thank, uh, I, I'm much thankful, but I want to say, yeah, I guess the word would be thankful. I'm, I'm thankful for uh, brothers in the ministry and the message we heard yesterday and last night and the fellowship that we enjoy when we get together. And uh, it's, been, it's been good. This is a good, very good thing, except Sunday meetings. Very good. And uh, one thing, I, I, before, I even, before I even forget it, we all mentioned it yesterday. This morning, while we're assembled here, we have about a quarter of a million Americans in Iraq. And we do not forget them every morning, every day. So I think it would be very suitable for us this morning to stand together and have a prayer on their behalf. If you would, I'd like for you to stand if you'd like. And uh, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Brother Dick Adams to have a prayer, please, on behalf of our soldiers. You open your Bible this morning to the book of Matthew, chapter 13. The subject was assigned to me on the, uh, the pearl of great price, the mystery of the church. And uh, we're just going to look at some things together. It's not going to be very difficult. Uh, it was very difficult. I couldn't sort it all out. So um, if, if I can sort it out, you can understand it, I guarantee you. But I want to read the text down in the book of Matthew, thir chapter 13, verse uh, 45 and 46. Jesus said, Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Uh, let me say some things about uh, uh, Matthew, first of all. Matthew, Matthew's gospel is unique, different from all the other gospels, from Luke, John, uh, Mark. He, if, and notice in Mark, he sets forth Jesus uh, more as his, in his personal ministry. 
The Bible begins by saying the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the first chapter of Mark. And Luke comes on the scene. They're all preaching the same gospel, but there are different characters. And Luke portrays Jesus Christ as the son of man, humanity. At least that's to me. That's what I get. It. And, and, and in Luke, he says, uh, uh, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. John portrays Jesus Christ as deity, as very God and very man. And the Bible says in John, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14 it says, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, which we know, of course, is Jesus Christ. But Matthew sets forth, I believe, Matthew reveals, Matthew reveals Jesus as king and his kingdom. And it's dealing with a kingdom. And it's like Brother Micah said sometime back, I remember he saying it somewhere, but, uh, uh, and you're going to have to make a distinction here too with, in the book of Matthew that the church and the kingdom are not synonymous. They are, the church is going, a part of the kingdom, will be, but it is not the kingdom. And the kingdom will be when Jesus Christ is king and reigning over the kingdom. And so uh, to understand that makes a lot of things a lot clearer. Uh, first of all, I noticed in Matthew chapter 1, the Bible points to some things like this. It begins with Jesus' uh, royal lineage, as it were. His royalty, his lineage. It says it like this. At the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David. That's royalty. We're talking about David and that kingdom. So he portrays him as his royalty. Chapter 2, it says, wise men came to Jerusalem. Remember, talking about his birth. But wise men came to Jerusalem and they were asking, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And then in chapter 3, it says, John the Baptist came on the scene and said, Behold, uh, uh, rather he says, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so he's talking about the kingdom. Let me say something about, we talked here this morning, the pearl of great Christ, the mystery of the church. Let me say about Israel here and about the kingdom as, uh, as Jewish people. To the Jewish people, the kingdom was not a mystery. It's not a mystery to them. As far as they're concerned, as a nation, as Israel, as Jewish people, it's quite simple. They are looking for Messiah, the king that will liberate them from Roman oppression and set them free and establish the kingdom back to Israel as it was in the days of David. When their sovereignty, their free, their name is known worldwide, that they wanted their kingdom. In fact, the matter is the question was asked, will thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Then I just... I think the woman at the well summed it up very well. When Jesus came to the well, was sitting there, and the woman came to draw water, and the woman said, and she summed it up for all of the Israelite people. She said, we know that Messiah cometh. And when he is come, which is called Christ, and when he has come, he will tell us all things. In other words, as Jewish people, they didn't accept the fact that he had come, but they said, we know he's going to come. Well, we know today that he not only was going to come, but he did come, and they didn't receive him. But let's look also. To the disciples, Paul said it like that, when Jesus speaking here, Jesus said to the disciples, he said, Tarry ye at Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And it was at that time, you remember in that scene, that the disciples, uh, they were gathered together. They, he said, hey, you tarry, you wait at Jerusalem until you are endued with power. They had all gotten together there at Jerusalem. And when Jesus came, the multitude asked him, they said, Will thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? We're all gathered to hear what better opportunity to restore the power and the right authority back to its people. Right. Put them down. Suppress the Romans and give us our kingdom. There's some things they did not see though. Right. Let me say, uh, and I'll, in just a moment, I'll get into this real quick and then I'll talk real fast and, and we'll get, 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 get it for you, brother. My call me, all right? 500 years before the birth of Christ, Zechariah prophesied this. He said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is, uh, what it says, he is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, the coat of the foal of an ass. And then later Jesus in the parable of the ten pounds said this. A certain nobleman went into a, country, a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and he delivered to them ten pounds. And he said, Occupy until I come. But his servants hated him. And the fact is, about the place they made light of him. But his servants hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. See? We're talking about a nation of people. I want you to understand, we're talking about a nation. 
not individual, a nation. That's important. Later, Paul said in Ephesians, I'm just setting the stage, giving you a bunch of scriptures, memor memorize them, so I can read them to you, and I'm going to get away from that. I'm going to talk to you in a minute. In Ephesians, Paul said it this way. Paul said, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if so be ye have heard of this, uh, the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, which aforetime was, uh, he said, uh, well, it was hid, he said, as I wrote afore in few words, he said, whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He says, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What was that mystery? Revealed, it had been hid all through the ages until the days of the apostle Paul. He said, but now it was hid from the, the, the he said, now it's revealed unto us by the Spirit. What was that mystery? He said, quote, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. In other words, when it comes to salvation now, when it comes to salvation, there's no longer Gentile, Jew, bond free, brother, all have the same access to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. No longer Jew or Gentile. But now I would say, this is important. Now, back as a nation, okay? When the Jewish people, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, when the Jewish people declared, we will not have this man to reign over us. When Jesus came in as king and they declared, we have no king but Caesar. When the Jews rejected Jesus as king, as Messiah that day, and the gospel says that Paul turned to the Gentiles. He said, Lo, see, you judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we turned to the Gentiles. From that time, Israel, the natural branches, was cut off. And the Gentiles, you and I, being wild by nature, were grafted in. But he says, Be not high minded. Don't get puffed up, church. He said, For the same God, he's able to graft Israel, the natural branches, in again. And he's going to do that. But he's not going to do it in the church age. As a nation. He's going to do that. God has a program. We'll show you. God has a program for the church. And brother, God has a program for Israel. And they are two separate programs. Look. In, in a parable, in, I wish notice verse 44. I can go back as much as I want. But I can't go on, brother. Dick. He's already told me to stay off his text. So I'm going to keep going back. No, I'll go. I want you to notice in verse 44. Jesus said again the parable, he said, speaking of parable, he said again the kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man has found, he hideth, and for joy thereof, he goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth the field. And now notice in our text, and he said again the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he has found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and bought it. Both Israel and the church are precious treasures in the sight of God. Okay? Can I tell you right now that the greatest blessing any nation, as a nation, will know in this life, right, in, in this world right now, politically speaking, the greatest blessing we will ever enjoy is by just staying friends to that little place of a chunk of land called Israel. Amen. Let me tell you something. Israel is not blessed because America is on her side. America is blessed because we have stood by Israel. Amen. God has blessed. He said all the way back, how I many centuries before this nation ever thought about being a nation here in North America, God already declared there would be no weapons formed against Israel that are prosper. And brother, God stuck these guns on that. Amen. Right? Amen. But let me just notice. God has, I said, let me say, for, for a peculiar treasure, Israel as a nation. The Bible says, quote, For the Lord God, for the Lord has chosen Jacob unto himself. And Israel for his peculiar treasure. Now you don't have to agree with this right if you don't want to. I believe according to Old Testament teaching. I believe Israel is, 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 is the way God has showed Israel as a nation as God's wife. And I believe he's got the New Testament church as Jesus Christ's bride. Right? All right, look. Now, I say peculiar treasure. Of the New Testament church, now Paul wrote now, not only is Israel peculiar treasure, but Paul says it like this, who gave himself for us, pointing to Jesus, and said, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And so we're peculiar. 
While God has a specific program or plan for the church, God also has a specific program or plan for the nation of Israel. But right now, individually, the work through the work of God, by the grace of God, through the finished work of Christ, by the Holy Spirit, everybody, every man, woman, everybody you meet every day has the same access to God through faith in Jesus Christ. Right? Notice, Paul said, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. He says, The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Right? Isn't that great? All men. Now I want to notice now verse 44. That, something about this difference in 44 and 45. The treasure hid in the field, notice there, the treasure hid in the field, I believe it's Israel, not the church. Amen. I believe when you get to the next verse, you're talking about the church. Right. And you don't have to agree with this, and it's not complicated, but it, it is interesting, and I believe it, it'll, it'll bear out by the scriptures. I, I say, it, the, Israel here is the, tre uh, is the treasure hid in the field. Yeah. Jesus said, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man, and he said, the field is the world. Right? Now this, Israel was scattered all over the world. Hid as it were in the world. It began in the days of Paul, in the days of, uh, uh, you know, in the days of Stephen and so on. It began and, and because of the persecution, hey, that's how God got the church away from Jerusalem. He persecuted them until they were forced westward. And he moved them westward. Remember? Under the great persecution in the days of Saul of Tarsus. And so I, I say it this way. Notice first now. Uh, the church is not hid in a field. Notice here this treasure was taken. He, when he found this treasure of great he, he went and hid it. Right. Hey, he didn't run and hide the church, people. The church is not hid, but rather set up, as it were, a pedestal for all the world to look at, to see. Right? In fact, look at it like this. The church has been sent to the world to proclaim the gospel. The church has been sent to the world to uh, be a light to all the world, not to hide. Right? The fact of the matter is, he says it like this. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Hey, you know what? I, 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 now, you, you just all look right up here now. You forget about all the Bible works and everything right here. The reason we are assembled here this morning, the reason we keep Sunday school and preach the gospel in the church, the reason we walk in and we shake hands and hug one another and fellowship with one another and smile and have a good time with one another, the reason we portray ourselves as Christians and not like the world is because that we are right unto the world, not to be hidden from the world. We are going through the world. Amen. Right? All right. Amen. We go through the world. So we're not hid. Israel's hid. But can I tell you, Israel's just hid until Brother Jesus Christ revealed them right. as the nation. Okay. That's the matter is. I would not doubt but what Israel accomplished more in her short time left yet to come than the church has through all of her history. All right, look. Some would say it like this. Some would say, and I've heard it insinuated like this, okay, that uh, the buyer here, that the one that found, he found the pearl of great price and he bought it, you know, that the buyer here is a sinner and you hear a priest kind of a sinner seeking Christ. I'll tell you one thing straightforward. It does not hold water scripturally. Now, the Bible here is not sinner. First of all, let me say it like this. Why? Number one, the sinner has nothing to buy salvation with. Nothing. Not a man living has anything to buy salvation with. The Bible says, quote, For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish, without spot. There is not a man living, never has lived, that has anything capable of purchasing salvation. It is solely God's grace that gives you salvation. Nothing you have to give. Not good works, not anything. Not church membership, not baptism, not anything. The only thing that you, listen, the only way you ever accept Jesus Christ is by the grace of God. Let me say it this way also. Salvation, listen, it, it cannot be bought. Number two, salvation can't be bought. It is the gift of God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse uh, uh, 6, six verse 3, I believe it is, it says, uh, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Gift of God, right? And then let me say it this way. I say, 
It's not the sinner seeking Christ. He can't buy it. He doesn't have anything about with. And it couldn't be bought if he did have anything because it's a gift of God. And finally, I'll say it this way. If it were not for God's grace, God's unmerited love towards you and me, if it were not for the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit, there's not a sinner alive, never has been, that would even have a desire to come to Christ just not in his nature. That's right. Brother, it takes the preaching of the gospel and the work of the Holy Spirit to bring conviction and to bring salvation. Amen. That's right. Let me tell you how you were saved. I wasn't there when all of you were saved. I was there when some of you were. But I'll tell you how you were saved. You were saved because some preacher stood up, opened that Bible, and preached the gospel, and you believed the gospel of Jesus Christ and confessed him and believed with all your heart and confessed him, or you were never saved this time. Because there is only one way of salvation, through the preaching of the gospel. Look, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, uh, uh, who in, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. He said, Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, that's the key, the next three words. But God, who is rich in mercy, for the great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, has quickened us together with Christ, for by grace are ye saved. Right? It was God's grace. Brother, God's good. God was good in sending his son to sacrifice. He was good in giving his word and preserving his word. And he's still good in the, in the church work in calling preachers and the church still carrying on the gospel. God's good. This is God's grace. God's grace. And you've been uh, allowed to be a part of that. So, uh, but I, I, I'm down to verse 44 still. I'll get to verse 45. Looking at verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he has found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. What do you notice some facts, some similarities about this man, this merchant man, and Jesus Christ? The merchant man. First of all, this man had resolve, determination, and a mission. Right? Notice, he was a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. That's what he was looking for. He knew what he was looking for. Brother, he went after it. I want you to notice something else. Jesus Christ gave sight to the blind. He caused the lame to walk. He raised people that were dead. I mean, been dead and buried and starting to sink and rose them from the dead. He established the New Testament church. He was the greatest teacher that ever lived in this world. But he came not just to do that. He came for another reason than that. He came, the Bible says, to seek and to save that which was lost. His vision for leaving heaven and being born into this world, taking on human flesh and dying on that cross, was to save those that were lost, though he'd done everything else. His mission was to seek and to save those that were lost. The mission of this church and these little churches in our association is still the same thing, is to reach out to those that are lost not get wrapped up and involved in some kind of program, whether it be political or religious or anything else, but to reach out to the lost. That's right. Notice, he had resolve. This man here was willing to pay the ultimate price for that pearl when he found it. The Bible says that when he found it, he sold all that he had and bought it. Jesus Christ gave the ultimate price. There was nothing more that anybody could ever give than Jesus Christ did. The Bible says, if I jotted it down, I hope I did. But the Bible says it's something like this. Paul was addressing the Ephesian elders. He said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made your overseers to feed the flock of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Brother, that's the ultimate price. He died and purchased your and my salvation with his own blood. And now extends the invitation. Hey, salvation is free. I have bought and paid for it. Whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. Notice. Hey, I, I was just, I thought about this merchant man. I, can you, this merchant man, when he found that goodly pearl, had no second thoughts about what he was going to do about it. He had no second thoughts about buying it. Brother, he just went and sold everything he had and bought that one pearl. That's the way it is with the church. 
Jesus Christ had no second thoughts about what he was going to do. You know that? He just gave everything he had and bought it. Can I, can I say it this way? Jesus did not go up Galgotha's hill kicking and screaming and dragging his feet and saying, I don't want to go. He simply said earlier in the garden, Father, if it be any other way possible, let this cup pass from me. Can I tell you that Jesus willingly, without any second thought, paid the full price for you and me. That paid it freely. I want you to know, if I draw let me ask you, do it this way. There are some personal nouns in you. These are not pronouns. I want you to listen to this. There is some personal nouns. Listen to what Jesus said. I say, brother, he laid it down. He had no second thoughts. He said, Father, I'll buy it. I'll pay the price. I'll redeem them, but it cannot redeem them. So I'll pay the price for their redemption. I like what somebody, I wish I could remember the song. But part of the word says, Father, I'll go, and I'll pay the sin dead in Calvary's flow. I'll pay, I'll bury my body, the marks of the cross, to pay that, to the, uh, redeem that sinner that's sin sick and lost. He said, Father, I'll do it. But listen to what he says here. Listen, I like the word. Jesus said, Therefore does my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man takes it from me. I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment is obviously from my Father. He said, I can do it. I can pay it in full. And he's the only man that could do it. He found it. He purchased it. He bought it. Salvation is the gift of God, solely the gift of God. Notice. I want you to notice before, now also, before this merchant man bought the, the pearl of great price, hey, this pearl was in possession of somebody else. Had you noticed that? Why would he need to buy it if it didn't belong to somebody else? The Bible says he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Bought it from somebody, didn't he? He bought it. Can I tell you that Jesus Christ, brother God the Father, gave his best, gave his son, and he did it to purchase you and me, to redeem you and me from something, brother. Notice, the Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The nature of every body you know, separate apart from those that are saved, and the Holy Spirit is well men, their nature is worldly. It's satanic. They are of their father the best, and the lust of their father they will do it. And the only thing that will change their nature. Can I tell you what? We talk about, uh, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I, I'm going to say it this way. Brother, I, I need up. I, this is going to be for later. Why get down? I know. Somebody's not going to agree with it. So I'll be careful. Can I tell you? We made a mistake about 10 years, almost a decade ago, when we didn't, did not take Mr. Hussein out, period. That's exactly right. I want to see those people liberated. They have never had freedom. They have never known freedom. They don't know what freedom is in that country. That father is so protesting that. As far as I'm concerned, they have the right to protest that. They don't let them. We have the right to call them American Jews. But I tell you, there will be enough disaster. There will be enough wisdom. There will be enough patriotism in our nation. You say there's not learning nothing down the streets of our major city protesting while our boys are carrying their arms in other countries. You go one step farther, just from a political thing, and then I'll be clear away from it. There is a gentleman sitting in Charleston, sitting in the news, speaking in Charleston, called Mr. Bird, that is old enough and seen all enough, brother, he needs that. I'll tell you what, when we have men crawling through the sands and over there right now, I'm talking about right now, this hour, brother, in full camp, uh, in, 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 in those suits to protect them from chemical warfare, they're fighting and dying. They have done that this week for you and me. We don't need somebody representing West Virginia that I need to ridicule our president and our men more than Saddam Hussein himself. And he's done that. I just happen to be an American. And I love it. And if I didn't, I'd go somewhere else. All right? I, was, I mean, I told you some of you wouldn't like it. That's all right. There's some people like me and some don't. And I, like, I understand that too. I want you to notice something. Notice, he bought it. Can I say it this way? Jesus had to die to redeem you and me because we could not redeem ourselves. 
He brought us back into fellowship with God the Father. Right? In fact, man, let me say this. Paul said, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Paul's not saying, I'll just keep going to church. I'll keep going. I'll sing in the choir. I'll study my Bible more. I I'll be better in the community. I'll just keep going on. And after a while, uh, uh, until, I can cont uh, until I can control my own carnal nature, I'll just keep trying harder and harder. Can I tell you, that man does not live that can try harder and harder at anything and control his carnal nature. The only one that can control the carnal nature within you is the Holy Spirit of God that indwells you. Amen. If, he's not, yeah. if he does not indwell you, you cannot control your own carnal nature. Right. You can give up this and that and stop bad habits. You know what? Just exactly like the Bible says in the Old Testament. That old hog will return right back to the wall. He's giving time. All right? Watch. Notice. No, I'll skip it. I'll start skipping on that. Uh, let me read something to you. Paul said, I believe Paul's saying right here, I, I can't even, even after I'm saved. By my own strength, I can't control my old carnal nature. Anybody, maybe I'm, maybe I'm way off. Anybody in here, even though you're a Christian, and can say, yeah, I know that I'm, I'm a Christian, I know that I'm safe, and still do something and say, I don't know, why did I do that? You could all amen that because every one of you feels the way. Just for the rest. Why do we do that? Because when we do not yield ourselves to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, as not a person in this building is not capable of doing the same thing the world does. Why don't you listen to this? Paul said, quote, For the grace of God that... It, it, let me read this to you. Uh, Paul said, For the good that I would... Now, I'm talking about the Apostle Paul. I'm not talking about before he was saved. I'm talking about after he was saved. I'm talking about the Apostle Paul. Paul said, For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil that I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. He said, I find in the law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. He said, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my, in my members. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this sin? And then he said, I'll thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. He can do it. And he's the only one can do it. You see, the problem is this, quite simple, people. We've been trying to clean the old fella up and get him in church when we need to get this Jesus Christ to do him and get him saved and then get him in church. Perhaps you said like that. I just can't understand this. Thing. I just can't understand what happens when a, to a sinner when through the grace of God and by the finished work of Jesus Christ and the preaching of the gospel, that person is saved. I just can't understand all that. Well, hey, let me give you some good, good fresh news. Join the bandwagon, people. Because there's very few people alive that can understand all of it either. Hey, man, let me give you an illustration. By the way, you don't have to understand it all. You just have to believe it and do it. All right? Let me give you an example. Remember all the old blind man? Jesus, Jesus said that he, 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 he spit on the ground. Now, that's my kind of doctor. I can understand that. Let me take you home with a whole bunch of pills, you know, and go see the psychologist and this and that. Nothing wrong with all that. Trying to figure out what happened. How many religions have got to get this? How did all this happen? And finally they called that old boy and questioned him. They called his parents and questioned him. And then they called him back up. And that religious crowd said, Well, praise God. Give God the glory. We know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. He done that on the Sabbath and so on. We know he's a sinner. You know what that old boy's answer was? But he didn't have all the answers, but he got to fix that time. He said, Whether he's a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I do know is that whereas I was blind. Now I see. Can I tell you? I don't know why, how God, in all of his love, could save his son to that cross and hear his own son say, My God, my God. Why has God forsaken me? I don't understand all of that, but he did. I believe it. And I'm trusting. And I know. Amen. And I don't have to understand it all. And I got five or five minutes. We go to this and up here. It's a little bit. 
But no. Almost in a hurry. Verse 46. Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it? The pearl, like the church, is unique, number one, in its formation. Preacher Mike, I'd rather have you, I've heard you preach this so well. I wish you'd do this right now. A pearl is formed within an oyster because of a wound, do we say? A grain of sand or something gets in there. And that oyster secretes it as a secretion. It just keeps overlapping that and overlapping that until it gets a protective thing. It overlaps it. And that pearl is formed. And I thought, well, what a good example. It is formed by that, I mean, that secretion around that thing. And then by accretion, in other words, the adding to that, by that oyster, it just keeps growing and growing and it becomes a pearl of great price. Let me say it this way. The life of the church, your life, your spiritual life, if it were not also but a same basis, if it were not for the fact that Jesus, as it were, secreted, shed his own blood for you and me, you would have no life, period. Now. And by the accretion or by the continual adding of one member at a time, his church keeps growing and growing until he returns for with uh, uh, faith. Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm trying to hurry now. I don't like doing that. Not only, by the way, also, that secretion that forms that pearl and so on also is protection to it. Right? I mean, within that oyster, Doug's done it. I mean, he'll never admit to it. I've done it. Walk up and down those uh, level runs. See, we'd find we call them clams or whatever. We'd forever find it. I just hope one day I get this pearl and land and I surely one day we'll get one inside. There'll be a pearl, you know. Whatever it is. But there was a protection about that, that pearl too, wasn't there? Can I tell you there's a protection about you? You're not perfect by any means. You're saved, but you're still not perfect. The only fellow inside you is perfect is the Holy Spirit, that inner man that dwells you. Can I tell you there's protection there? The Bible says it like this. The Bible says, uh, quote, In whom ye also trusted, talking about Jesus, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. Sealed to the day of redemption. Also, not only by formation, but also by uh, uniformity. Now, this is important, and I'll hurry and close with this. The pearl is precious because of the way it's formed, and the pearl is precious because of its uniformity. If it was all scratched and marred and, and, and divided and so on, it wouldn't have any value. And so it is with the church. Paul said, quote, For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many, yet is, uh, yet is one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be bond or free, Jews, Gentiles, or whatever. We all listen. Well, I, 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 I like to feel the rest of that, but I don't think. Can I tell you, it's one of the sweetest things about the world of great power of the church is the way we were born. And by the uniform form, our unity is one of us. You can have this church that is properly preached and not stop looking in. By the unity, you might have a little bit. But when a handful of them get in fellowship and unity, but you can stop there. I believe I'll go with that. Thank you, Brother Larry.